We've already begun to enter into our scripture this morning through the time of prayer, and now we look to the Word of God to look at the bigger story that surrounds this scripture today. And so we'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 28 through 34. Let us hear now the Word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any question. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we truly thank you that you hear our deepest questions, our greatest needs, and that you respond in the ways that only you can. And so today, as we come to your word, we hear it proclaimed speak into the deepest part of ourselves today too. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. When we think of Jesus and his interactions with people, we probably think most often of the ones where he's healing people or teaching people. Normally, these are very warm interactions with Jesus, and you can kind of imagine him being kind of like this big cuddle bear, almost, if I can go that far to say it, where he lovingly guides, and he's instructing, and he's embracing, he's just touching people's lives in powerful ways, in heartfelt ways. Many of the interactions we read about Jesus in the Gospels would fall into this category. But that's not the only side of Jesus that we get to see and to meet in Scripture. Here and in other parts of the Gospels, we experience the Jesus who's not afraid to back down from a hard conversation, who's not afraid to be challenged or to engage with people in conversation about their deepest questions. The scripture we've read, to, we've read today is part of a larger conversation that Jesus has already been having with other religious experts. They'd been engaging with Jesus about debates about if they should pay taxes and if there really was such a thing as a resurrection. And these legal experts in the conversations that came before this, they were actually trying to entrap Jesus into saying something that he shouldn't say something against God or even against the Roman government. And of course, Jesus trounces all of them because, well, he's Jesus. That's pretty much easy for him. The legal expert, though, who asked Jesus this question about the first commandment, he'd overheard Jesus' responses to the other people, and he was struck by Jesus' wisdom, the scripture says. And so he wanted to ask a question of his own. He was curious about what Jesus would have to say about this. And unlike the other confrontational debates Jesus had just gotten finished with, this person really just wanted to talk. I could imagine that this must have been a question that was 
on his heart for a really long time. He'd been thinking about it and wondering. And now he had the opportunity to ask about it. And Jesus heard his question. He heard it. And his response to the religious expert is one that is considered one of the most profound statements of Jesus. The command to love God and love neighbor as yourself is considered one of the clearest teachings on what it means to follow God. In fact, in the United Methodist Church, we dig deeper into this teaching of Christ through a commitment to the three general rules of the church that says a faithful follower of Jesus should do no harm, should do good, and should stay in love with God through the practices of faith. The fact of the matter is, even we couldn't sum it up better than Jesus, which shouldn't be too shocking because, once again, he's Jesus. He's Jesus. Jesus didn't make this stuff up either. He was quoting from the books of law, from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, words that the religious experts probably would have known by heart because memorization is how religious scholars learned the scriptures in that day. He paraphrased these scriptures, though, and he connected them together in a way that had never been done before. We read, we read this encounter through the lens of having heard these two phrases connected over and over again, love God, love neighbor, love God, love neighbor. And so we don't always pick up on how transformative of a connection this was for those who were hearing it for the first time. But for the religious leaders hearing Jesus connect together the love of God and love a neighbor, this would have literally blown their minds. It would have in that day, at that time. They knew these scriptures by heart because this is what they knew. But it would have come alive for them in a new way in this moment. Pieces of a puzzle would have fallen into a place. Actions that they would have long since compartmentalized for so long now belong together and they mutually supported one another. Of course this makes sense. Loving God should affect how you treat and care for others. How you treat and care for others should be a reflection of the way that you love God. They go together. Of course they do. Of course they do. This is one of the reasons why the religious leader who asks the question of Jesus in the first place, he repeats it back to Jesus. Did you notice that? He repeats it almost exactly what Jesus said with just a few minor tweaks. He's processing this profound connection of the Holy Scriptures out loud as he's putting these things, this love of God and this love of neighbor together in his mind and uncovering the profound truth of Jesus' words. It's something many of us do when we're putting things together in our own minds, when we finally see a connection between thoughts or words ideas or experience that we've never seen how they were related before. But now, through wisdom gain, we do. We repeat it, either out loud or in our heads. We know this to be true, and we know this to be true, and now we know that they're true together. He gets it. He finally gets it. The whole story of the law and the prophets. In fact, in other versions of the scripture, Jesus says that the whole of the law and the prophets hangs on these two commandments. But he finally gets it. And he's loved this word for so long. And he's summed up now in two short sentences. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. They are profound. They are transformative. They are sentences of truth a person can live their entire life by. And as if this encounter 
We're not already powerful enough to give this religious leader something to think about for days and even years. Jesus offers one last word or statement, last words of Jesus in this place, to the man standing before him who's just put these pieces together on what it means to live a life of faith. He looks at this man and he tells him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And the mic drops. And there's nothing else that can be said. You who see the necessity of God's love taking over the whole of your life, you who see that loving others is just as necessary and is an outflow of the life lived in love of God, you have just about got it. The message version of this scripture paraphrases the final statement as saying that having a grasp of the love of God and the love of neighbor puts you on the border of God's kingdom. You're on the threshold, you're about to cross over, that you're on the edge of getting the whole picture of what God is up to. You're on the edge of getting it all when you love God and love neighbor. Theologian Catherine Keller talks about living in the kingdom of God as life on the edge. Life on the edge of what has been and what might be. And she takes very seriously Jesus' words that the kingdom of God is actually among us. It's here and that we're living in it and continuing to live into the fullness of what kingdom life is. It's life on the edge. How many of you are feeling kind of edgy this morning? Were you excited about waking up in the morning wondering what the day might hold? Are you always thinking about the next thing that you might get to do, the people who might enter into your life, the new insights that you will gain, the people you will get to love, and the God you'll get to love all the more? Love God. Love neighbor. It's personal. It's public. It transforms you. It transforms others. It transforms the world. And it's not just a heart skips a beat, the sweaty palms, the butterflies, and the stomach kind of love. It's a big love. It's an all-encompassing love. It's a love that demands everything of you. It's a love that goes deep and spreads out wide. It loves everything the way that it is now, but also pushes up and loves everything that one day will be. Loving God and loving neighbor, according to Jesus, is one of the ways that we experience the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is being the real presence and work of God in our midst And it's also how we expand the impact of this kingdom, expand the presence of God, expand the work of God into the lives of others and into the larger world around us. I think of Kingdom Life of the Edge a lot of times watching my children discover something new almost every day. And the creative ways that they figure out how to accomplish a task. I mean, who would have known that drawer handles on the kitchen cabinets were actually a ladder to get you up on the counter? But my daughter figured it out when she was two. (laughs) When she was two. Who knew that board books strewn out on the floor in a pathway are the perfect obstacle course for the best race ever? Perhaps Jesus was on to something when he said that the kingdom belonged to the children and those who wanted to really get it, they needed to approach it like a child, impulsive, creative, innovative, excited, loving with abandon, not holding back from pursuing the task in front of them, life on the edge. Life where stepping into the unknown is a common current occurrence and the willingness to be different and do something different is a normal decision one would make. Loving in this kind of way is living life on the edge, on the edge of reason, on the edge of possibility. 
letting the love of God permeate through all of ourselves that as we grow in relationship with God, it bubbles up and out into the world around us. It's living a life of saying yes time and time again to the things of God that are calling us forward. And it's also having the freedom and strength to say no to the situations that have too long kept us in bondage. It's life on the edge that happens because we love God. Life where choosing to love God and neighbor takes you to places you never thought possible and to love people that you never thought that you would meet. And the places you never thought possible to go don't have to be thousands of miles away either because it can be places and people right here in our community that you never go to or see for one reason or another. Love like this is always going to be edgy because it's always going to push us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to embrace the other, those who are different from us. It's life on the edge because we love others. Christians since the beginning of the formation of the church have been known for living life on the edge. They acknowledge, they acknowledge the existence even of women and children when they were often forgotten and pushed to the sidelines. And they even granted women leadership, authority, and the life of the early church. The traditional lines of demarcation that were drawn based upon race, religion, gender, and nationality were drawn, were always questioned. There is no man, no woman, no slave, no free, no Jew, no Greek, but all are one in Christ Jesus. They were willing to talk and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people who other religious groups had written off as unworthy and, yes, even unsavable. At a time of great economic austerity, they pushed aside all norms of financial advancement and chose instead to hold all things in common and to give to one another as there was need. They made sure all people were cared for in the life of the worshiping community and even those outside of the life of the worshiping community benefited from the work of the early church. Ancient historians have even documented that when great pandemics would sweep through the big cities of the day, pandemics so bad that even the doctors and the city leaders would flee to avoid getting sick. During these pandemics, though, it was the Christians who not only stayed in the city, but they came to them. They came to the cities to care for the sick, to bury the dead, to care for the orphans and widows, and feed the weak and the hungry. And many of these people died caring for others, but there were some who survived and became immune to these diseases that were hurting others, which eventually inspired the future research into how this could even be possible. The work of Christians in the early church was so edgy and it was so out of the box, unheard of for its day, that as recorded, people would be talking about them in the streets. They would be. And do you know what they would say? See how they love one another. See how they love one another. To be honest, if I were to hear that said about people in this community about us, about First United Methodist Church, see how much they love one another. It would tickle me to death. It would. I think it would tickle you all to death too. Because I would see it as this amazing opportunity to say, yes, yes, we do love one another. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you about the love that we've come to know, the love that we've allowed to take root in our lives, the God who loves us, that he would send his son to die for us, that we can experience this love in its fullness and to overflow with this love in the life of the world. Let me tell you about why we love one another, why we love you, and why we want you to know the greatest love of all. This is life on the edge. This is loving God and it's loving neighbor. This is loving like Jesus.
we don't have to be the early church to love like this. There are opportunities each and every day to love in the way that Jesus commanded us to love. We just have to be on the lookout for them and to be willing to let ourselves be pushed to the edge because of the love of God and love of neighbor. To be pushed to the edge of our seats to greet the people around us we don't know yet, but they're in this place. To be pushed to the edge of the walls of the church, to the people who are not here yet, but are just waiting to be invited to come. To the edge of our parking lot, whom people use all throughout the week as they go in and out, using the Justice Center that's right next door to us. To the edge of our streets, where there are people who are lonely and in need of a friend or a helping hand. To the edge of our city, where there are instances of great need and poverty that must be addressed. To the edge of our country and world, where there are needs for justice, reconciliation, and renewal that are just waiting for someone to care enough to address them to care enough that God's kingdom will come and God's will be done. But we have to be willing to go there, to go to the edge. Where we believe that the love of God and the love of others, that it is first, it is the greatest, it is the only way to experience life at its fullest. To be Christ's disciples, transforming the world because of love. Y'all, I'm not always good at loving like this, I'll be honest. I'm not. I have my own fears and my own doubts and even my own insecurities about many things and we're often our own worst enemy at loving God and loving others. We stop ourselves from fully giving our, over ourselves to this kind of love because it demands so much of us. It seems too simple to be true, too big to know where to start. It sometimes seems unreasonable, and it's always easier said than done. But I don't think we were meant to love like this on our own. That God will send the Spirit to help us to get better at loving like this day by day. And God sends us one another. He sends us the body of Christ to encourage, to hold each other accountable, and to know that we are not alone. We're in this together. This love is not meant to be done by just one, but by many. We're in this together. And it's a love that we're not told to be perfect at, but to grow in, to be seek to be doing better tomorrow than we are today. This is the kind of love that we're invited into each and every day. And today, brothers and sisters, I invite you to experience this love of God once again. Perhaps you are like the religious leader and you need to experience this love of God and others in a way that you've never understood it before, but you have real questions and you're just trying to better understand. Perhaps you need to experience this love of God and love of others in a way that makes you stop in your tracks and can reconsider where you are going, what you are doing, and who you are with. Perhaps you need to experience this love of God and love of others in a way that pushes you to the edge of, well, anything. The edge of where you are now. But we know that the love of God and the love of others, it can do any and all of these things and so much more. We just need to say yes. Yes, I will love God all my heart and soul and mind and strength and I will love others as I love myself to follow this example of Jesus and love in the way that he showed us how to love in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just do praise you for your love. Your love that is such a guide through all of life. And we thank you that you have given us this great love, not just to be experienced ourselves, but that it is so big and so wide that it must be shared with others. So help us to do that. Help us to love like you have told us, how you have shown us that we will truly give ourselves for you and for others for the sake of your name and your kingdom, we pray. Amen.